Hey everyone, welcome to you Fighting Over the Card Catalog, a snarky look back at young adult novels of the 80s and 90s. I'm Jess. I'm Steven, and I'm here to make my wife happy. We're taking a journey to find out how many terrible, and hopefully some not so terrible books from my youth I can get my husband to read before he reconsiders his whole marriage. Hi. Hey love. Happy World Theater Day. Oh yeah. Not today. It's actually on Friday, but it's the day this comes out. Okay. So, I'm pretty sure there is no theater happening anywhere in the entire world right now. Right. Anyway. Yeah, no theater. No theater. Yeah, we were supposed to see Come From Away last Saturday, and I'm real sad we couldn't. But. I mean, but technically in Collin County, you could have theater. Right, we could. Because in Collin County, where we live, all businesses are considered essential. Right. So We'll get to that later. Okay. I've got that for later, yeah. But I do understand why we couldn't go see it, and I'm not mad about it. And the Dallas Summer Musicals Twitter account keeps yelling about keeping your tickets. We're trying to reschedule, and it was very abrasive and i didn't appreciate it yeah. but anyways yeah and apparently most um insurances for tickets oh yeah do not cover epidemics so which is bullshit that's buck wild i mean i'm sure it's down in the fine print somewhere but not something somebody would normally read no and it's not something you just buy insurance for tickets like i can't go for this day or, you know, or the theater burned down or, you know, whatever it is. Right. You think, because okay, they're much I got more insurance. Than a pandemic. Yeah. You think, uh, you think I just bought insurance. That means if I can't go or the thing can't be held, then I get my money back. Yeah, that's the thing. That's not the case. Because it's not even on you, it's on extenuating circumstances and it should cover that. Right. But it does not. No. Because you have to have. Sp- Special insurance for that. That is bullshit. And nobody knows that. We do now. Here's your public service announcement. (laughs) So let's remember the good times when you could go to theaters before World War II. This is set in the 30s. Because this week. Oh, I got you. I was going to, I was just going to mention that that there's a girl who, you know, we're big FC Dallas fans. And there was a a lady who drove to New York. Oh, I didn't know she drove. Drove to New York to go to the first away game of the season. like 28 hours. And she gets there and she texts in the FC Dallas fan group on Facebook that she's so excited. She's just getting to New York. She can't wait for the match. And like 30 minutes later, they put out that they were canceling mm-hmm. the match. And so she is the one who told us that um, she had insurance on her tickets and she couldn't get her money back. Everybody's like, keep your tickets. They're going to they're, they're gonna make up the, the match. And we're like, yeah, but she's not going to drive back to New York. Hell no. To go to that match. But she's lucky she didn't get the COVID. Yep. I've so. seen uh, their little non-social um, distancing that's happening in New York with people sitting right next to each other on the benches at the, at the little lakes in the parks. Probably not now. Uh, this was a picture from today. Oh, no. Yes. When they're talking. Uh, anyway. Pe- we'll get people, to all that later. Yeah, okay. Let's have fun. Yeah. All right. So we were supposed to do theater shoes um, because of the appropriate name. Um, but it referenced back to this so much that I decided we just had to switch because you wouldn't understand it. Um, so, but really, this has more theater than ballet in it. So. It works. Yeah, it's kind of weird that, that it's called ballet shoes because, I mean, that's really just a very small, insignificant yeah. part, really. Yeah. So, anyways, this week we read Ballet Shoes by Noel Streetfield, published in 1936. Mm. That's old, y'all. I was wondering what kind of time frame this mm. was. Tell us there about was, it. There was something... There was something in the book, and I was like, I wonder what time frame <sighs> this is supposed to be set in. Yeah. Uh, so I guess it was modern times, but in the 30s but when she wrote old. it. Yeah. 
Okay, so Pauline, Petrova, and Posey are orphans determined to help out their new family by joining the Children's Academy of Dance and Stage Training. But when they vow to make a name for themselves, they have no idea it's going to be such hard work. <laughs> they lost themselves into a world of show business, complete with working papers, the glare of the spotlight, and practice, practice, practice! <laughs> Pauline is testing for the movies. Posey is a born dancer, but practical Petrova finds she'd rather pilot a plane than perform a pirouette. Each girl must find the courage to follow her dream. Aww. So, on the scale of one being the best book ever to Demetrius gets a ten, sucking the soul from your love of reading, what do you give it? Well, I have to say after last week's book, thank you. This one was much better. I give yeah. it a three. Yes. Oh, it's wow. Yeah. Yes, it's quite good. I give it a two. Um, simply because... The characters are a bit too perfect in Mary Sue, mm. you know, uh -huh. it's like, well, at least um, Pauline and Posey are. Right. So, yeah, that's the only thing. It it reminded me a little bit of the Royal Tenenbaums, which happens to be one of my favorite all-time movies. Oh. I mean, they're not as fucked up as the Tenenbaums. Well, that's that's true, but see... You're you're only seeing in the you're see you're starting out in the Royal Tenenbaum seeing the adults, right? Whereas the kids, okay, because they're unusually gifted, yes, and live in a big old house, yeah, yeah. Where where you know, and these are the kids' versions of that. You ha you haven't gotten to True. the to them being adults and fucked up yet. <laughs> so you think Posey ends up just smoking in the bathtub all the time? I mean, okay, think <laughs> about the actual lives of. An actress in the 30s mm -hmm. and a ballet dancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, an actress in the 30s is owned. Yeah. By the studio. System. Your, your image is owned. Everything you do is owned. Mm -hmm. um, where you can work, what films you can take, you're owned by a studio. Mm -hmm. And that caused a lot of people to spiral. Right. Um, She's not to say everybody Garland, did, probably. Yeah, not to say everybody did, but it, you know, it was rare for somebody to actually be in Hollywood mm -hmm. and make it out unscathed with, with great mental health. Mm -hmm. Um, and then a ballet dancer. I mean, it's the same with the company. I I cannot imagine being going into a career where you know, eventually your body cannot do it. And yeah. I, I'm, I, it's the same with any sport, I guess. Yeah, it is. Um, but, I mean, that has to be mentally hard. You know, a lot of people, their bodies, even into their teens and early 20s, can't handle it. Mm -hmm. um, but then to try to make a career out of it um, and do something long term. Yeah I, yeah, I I really couldn't imagine trying to do ballet <laughs> as a career. <laughs> No. Yeah. If you've ever seen Black Swan or anything oh like that, you get a little glimpse of that. But yeah. 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 Anyway, so we start out in the late 20s in London. Um, and we meet three adopted sisters, Pauline, Petrova, and Posey. So they were each discovered or slash stolen as a baby. By Matthew Brown, who is otherwise known as Great Uncle Matthew, otherwise known as Gum. Um, he saying he's absent-minded is an understatement. He's like some old colonizing, thieving archaeologist man. Um, yeah, he's one of these adventurer types that you see that uh, they just want to go out and discover things and bring it back to their place. And, and steal them from yeah. the indigenous people. Yeah, like his his um, house is filled with uh, fossils and uh, the nanny there is like, you can't have any more fossils. We have to clean all yeah. this and gather stuff. If you get anything, you have to throw something out. Which is kind of what I tell my mom, but... <laughs> uh, Nana's the real hero of this story, I mm. think. <laughs> um, yeah, so while he's out doing all this bullshit, uh, 
there's a supposed legit story for him, like, taking possession of each of the girls. Um, but I have to believe there's some shady shit going on for him to turn up with three babies. Are you going to tell how they came? He came well, with three babies? Pauline uh, was basically rescued from the wreck of the Titanic. Um, Petrova? I forget how Petrova was. Um, she was the... She's from Russia. Yeah, he was over... He was the one where the... Is she? She was the <laughs> one where the mother died. Mm-hmm. A year later, Gum brought Sylvia a second baby on his travels. This time, his leg had been giving him trouble, and he had been landed and put into a hospital. There, he had made friends with a Russian, a shabby, depressed fellow who yet somehow conveyed the impression that he hadn't always been shabby and depressed, but had once worn gay uniforms and had swung laughing through the snow in his jingling sleigh. Um, I'm imagining, uh, What's Dr. He... Shivago style. Oh, I was amidst, thinking Santa. But... Amidst a row of <laughs> bowing peasants. This man had left Russia during the revolution again. Uh, again. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Shivago-esque. The man left Russia during the revolution. He and his wife had tried to train themselves to earn a living. They had not been a success at wage earners and the wife became ill and died, leaving a small baby. When the man Boris okay. was going to die too, the nurses in the hospital were most concerned. Right. Yeah, I totally forgotten that. Yeah. Anyways, and then Posey, her dad was dead, but her mom is still alive. Yeah. She's a ballet dancer and she's basically just like, I don't have time for a baby yeah, and I gives her to gum. Right. And a pair of her point shoes. Right. What the fuck? No wonder Posey's fucked up. Anyway. Right. So he either just leaves or, in the case of Posey, just, like, sends her to his museum type yeah, house. Yeah, because basically um, Nana had said after the second one, that's it. No more. The two, two is full. Yeah, because they're all like a I'm year telling apart. You, I'm telling you if, the, if you bring another one, I'm giving notice. I'm telling you right now. So, we so did he it. didn't even face her, fa- you know, come face to face. He sent the baby to them in a basket. <laughs> this man. Yeah. Anyways, the them is uh, his great niece, Sylvia, who the kids end up calling Garney, short for guardian. And Nana is her childhood nanny. So. And then, yeah, he just fucks right on out of there. And he's like, here's money for five years. That should be good. Bye. So, yeah, they're just left with this big old house and these three girls to take care of. Uh, When the older girls start school, they're like, oh, hey, we need a last name. And they come up with Fossil as they're basically just a part of Gum's collection. <laughs> but they he, quite like it. He so. sends them a letter telling them he's going to be gone for at least five years, and he calls them his fossils. Right. So he does not return in the promised five years, and the money's almost gone, um, and they have no way to get in touch with him. So Sylvia and Nana decide to take in some boarders. This includes Mr. Simpson and his wife, and he owns a garage and a super cool car, which Petrova is very into. Um, And then there's Dr. Jakes and Dr. Smith. Um, They were teachers, and they end up taking over the girls' schooling once they can no longer afford school fees. And Theo Dane, who is a dance teacher, and she arranges for the girls to start classes where she teaches at the Children's Academy of Dancing and Stage Training. Dr. Jakes, uh, she specializes in literature and she and Pauline have this whole chat about how cool choosing your own name is and that maybe the girls will get their name in history books after they find their particular talents. So the girls decide to make a vow to be repeated on their birthdays. We three fossils vow to try and put our names in history books because it's our very own and nobody can say it's because of our grandfathers. 
I love it. Yep, very good. So at the school, Pauline finds that she has a big old talent for acting, uh, while Petrova hates it all, acting and dancing. Uh, she'd rather be home, you know, working on cars and reading about airplanes and shit. Um, but Posey has a real natural talent for dancing. Uh, when she's about six, uh, Madame Fidolia, the owner of the school who used to be a famous Russian dancer but left during the revolution, um, she starts giving Posey private lessons, something that is rarely done and certainly not so young. There's a special charity performance of The Blue Bird, and Pauline and Petrova are chosen to play the child leads, uh, mainly because they'll have an easy time rehearsing together. In the community theater world, that's like a legit reason for casting. Yeah. <laughs> casting. Uh, not necessarily rehearsing together, but it's like, oh, well, that's this kid's mom, so yeah, let's cast her as something, yeah. just because it is easier. Um, so Pauline is amazing, of course, while, uh, Petrova isn't exactly great. Uh, she gets lots of help at home with the doctors and she's better at rehearsals once they can wear a little bit of costume and that ends up helping her to pull off the performance. All right. But she's very glad when the rehearsing is all over. And there's so much script dialogue in this chapter that I thought was completely unnecessary. I don't know if it was as bad listening to it, but. Which one? <laughs> From the Bluebird. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I, I guess I kind of liked it, yeah. Because mm. it was kind of done like a like stream pages. of thought. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I could see how it would be different. Yeah. Anyway. Um oh, I did love the realism uh from rehearsals cuz it says at the rehearsals before they had to be word perfect, every single move that they made had to be written down into their books and learnt with their parts, and the stage manager at the same time wrote it into her book. And there it was, a part of the prompt copy. And even half a step taken when no move was down to be made caused trouble. Very true. Hmm. Um, and then, of course, they had to speak the exact script. No little word, even an or a the, could be wrong. Both Madame and Miss J said that an author wrote down what he or she wanted said. And no actor, amateur or professional, had a right to alter the words in any way whatsoever also true but <laughs> but there were times at your community theater where they did alter words oh yes on accidents but well let, i remember one time you telling me because they didn't like the language yes that happens quite a bit um the one i got most upset about was in music man and my character had, it was like her tagline. It was ye gods. But we couldn't say that. This musical's from the 1950s. And that was too much language for little Rusk, Texas. Yeah. I had to say ye gads. And I was livid. <laughs> <laughs> but I still had to say it. But yeah. Right. Even though it's technically it's illegal. against the law. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It says basically just like that in the book at the beginning of every script that, you know, you're not allowed to change any single little word unless, you know, it's an accident. That happens. But yeah. I get real upset about it. Right. <laughs> so anyways, I appreciated it saying it flat out like this so well in such an old book. So we see the girls being a little brats next uh pauline got to so used to being so important in that one show but then the next semester she's not and she's not old enough to work or perform in christmas pantomimes so she gets like hella angry in class and she gets kicked out but the french teacher tries to make her see that 
She can always be learning from others. And then Madame is rehearsing with uh, some of the girls working so much that Posey gets sent to a regular class. But she's like, I'm not learning anything, so I'm going home for the rest of the semester. So, bye. And they just fucking let her. (laughs) She's like six or seven at this point. Posey's my biggest problem with the book. I'll go ahead and say that. Anyways. So the next year, Pauline is, well, she's almost 12, um, which is how old you have to be to start to get a license to be able to work in professional theater. So Pauline gets sent uh, for an audition for Alice in Wonderland. And there's a big to do because she hasn't got a nice dress to wear, which is a very big deal in the school. Um, So they end up selling (laughs) these necklaces that Gum sent them to Mr. Simpson. Although he gives them a very good deal and they're able to buy them back over time as they start making money. Um, But with that, they're able to buy some fabric to make an audition dress, this black velvet dress, with the intention that they all wear it when they turn 12. Yeah, it's, it's something about the having a lot of him to let out so they can, yeah. you know, change the size as they need it. Pauline is perfectly amazing, of course, and so she gets the part, even though another girl from the school named Winifred is actually probably overall, all around, more talented, but she's just too plain looking. Uh, so she has to be the understudy, because Pauline is... Beautiful. And she looks the part. Right. She's got pale blonde hair. So Pauline has to go through this whole process of getting her license, which sounds very good and sensible to me. Uh, They make sure she's getting proper schooling and physically healthy. And they also make sure that the kids, like, and their parents, really, uh, behave with their money. Uh, half is to go into savings. So then they get, then a little bit goes to the school. And, you know, because they're training them for free. And it's basically like an agent's fee too. Right. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. So I get like 10%. Yeah. Um, and then for Pauline, some goes to Garney for the house. And then some for clothes. And then a tiny bit of pocket money for each of the girls. So Pauline does great with all of it until it starts to go to her head. She's supposed to put a robe on over her costume whenever she's on off stage, um, but she forgets it a lot, and she gets in trouble with the stage manager, and then she gets hella rude with him, which you are just you just never ever talk back to the stage manager. The stage manager is God, but she's a star. Uh, yeah. Um, but the managing director of the theater, Mr. French, sees her doing this, and then she sasses him big time. Mm -hmm. She, I mean, she's lucky she's not straight up fired at that point. Um, but she is demoted for the next night and has to understudy for Winifred. Um, but yeah, again, she's just hella lucky. That's all it was. But she learns her lesson course which is great and everyone's genuinely happy for Winifred and so am I poor Winifred (laughs) after Alice Pauline gets a part in a very boring straight play with a famous film actress eh, but she's not upset when it's over aside from not making any money Petrova turns 12 next year and the clothes become a problem again not only because they need two dresses for this one audition they're both going on for a midsummer night's dream but also it's summer and a black velvet dress really wouldn't do but pedrova uses her birthday money to get the fabric to make some white organdy dresses with sashes um the girls are really overly good I think about sharing and doing what's best for the mm-hmm. family mm-hmm. and yeah. Um I know I know that people who okay, so when 
well, uh, I got it. When some people grow up in a poor family, they have more empathy and are mm. better at sharing and things. Now, True. come to say that, I had a poor family also, and my mm-hmm. brother was not good at sharing. So. <laughs> <laughs> we would get hand-me-down clothes from the church, and he would go through the bags first and pick out what he wanted. Mm. And then I got to choose anything that was left over. Not that was surprising. how that went. Yeah. yeah. So he probably wouldn't share to buy fabric for new dresses. No. (laughs) Uh, So Madame and Mr. French are both part of the casting committee for Midsummer Night's Dream. And everyone else on it saw Pauline as Alice. And so they love her so fucking much that she doesn't even have to read for Peace Blossom. uh, Blossom. And... She just gets the part right away, and she gets to sit with them for the rest of the audition, and it's just absolutely ridiculous sounding, Hmm. especially for a professional show. The one girl who is supposed to audition for Mustard Seed is not there. So Pauline's like, oh, hey, what about my sister? And Petrova's like, fuck. (laughs) But she does an all right audition and gets the part right there. But as they're leaving... Poor old Winifred rushes in, all in a mess. Her family'd been away on vacation and just then got a telegram for it. And she was the one who was supposed to audition for Mustard Seed. Awkward. Uh, But to their credit, the girls try to get her to be seen by the audition committee, but feel terrible when she can't. But huzzah! So much money for the girls. Petrova almost gets fired during rehearsals, though, for not being able to say the line, and I, correctly. Poor Petrova. Uh, But again, they find a way to make it work. Rehearsing at home. So this is like an overblown, huge production. Like, there are hundreds in this cast, apparently. Yeah. That's what like, it sounds like. It sounds like a nightmare. The girls wear like body suits, which Nana absolutely detests. I mean, yeah, it was the thirties. Can you imagine skin tight body suits mm. on twelve year olds? Unbelievable. But they actually get to fly, which is awesome, and the only bit that Petrova actually likes. Um, until opening night. And then she finally understands some of the magic of being on stage in a really good show. Uh, The whole household goes to see it. But Posey is a little snob about the dancing. Surprised that the featured dancer was any good at all. Because she normally just dances in reviews. Such a low form of entertainment. Ugh. But the show is a great success, and they even add extra performances, so the girls get extra money. And Pauline thinks they should get extra pocket money. She would use it to go see other shows to learn from, which is really smart, yeah. I think. Uh, she doesn't get to see other professional. Right. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, but Petrova is like, you crazy. I would use it on books and books and books. And Posey would use it to see the ballet. But Garney says, hell no. They need to save and be able to get clothes. But Pauline's like, hell no. I'm 14 now. I don't have to report for a license. So I don't have to save my money. Um, And then Garney just like kind of conferences with the other adults in the house. And they're like, yeah, no, she should be able to do it. The doctors are like, you shouldn't save too much. And Anna's like, I mean, she's starting to be independent. It's good for her. And so, yeah, Garney ends up agreeing that that's what she can do. Uh, When they learn the show is finally going to close, the dude who plays Oberon is putting on Richard III afterwards. And there are two princes. uh, And Pauline thinks she and Petrova should get those damn parts. Because Pauline's a motherfucking hustler, man. Um, So they come up with this whole scheme to write this guy a letter and get to his dressing room. 
and it works and he sees them and they both do a monologue and they do pretty well and he's like yeah but it's not all up to him so they have to come meet with the producer the second she walks in pauline gets her part of course but the producer's like oh shit when petrova walks in and she laughs and she's all like i know i know i suck but listen, we really need this money. Uh, so he cast her in a small part. And she didn't want the big part because it was a shit ton of lines. And she's just not here for it. But she really wants some money because Garney is having to sell the house. Uh, Gum's money is all gone by this point, And they're just not making enough. And she's big stressed about it. And... She's obviously really sad that they're going to lose all their border friends, especially Mr. Simpson, uh, Petrova's particular friend. See, there's no way to say that without it sounding dirty and wrong, but yeah. it's completely innocent. <laughs> he lets her help out at the garage and they take rides together, which again sounds terrible for a grown man to be taking out a right. 12 year old girl. But it's completely innocent. I swear. Yeah, I can I can see this being innocent from a thirty standpoint, but there were certain things that he, that were written from, you know, written in, um, that I was like, oh man, that's shady. I know it's like you you keep expecting something bad to happen with this guy, but nothing does. It's fine. <laughs> Good old Doctor Jake's favorite Shakespeare play happens to be Richard the Third. So she really gets into helping Pauline and it's hella good for her. It sounds like she like truly becomes an actress with this role, like fully encapsulating the character and like really just becoming her, him. So she gets rave reviews for the sh show and, but the grownups only read out to her the stuff about her acting and not the bits about how pretty she is, assuming it wouldn't be good for her. And they're probably right. She's so damn good that she gets asked to do a screen test. And acting for film is a totes new experience for her, right down to the makeup, which looks ridiculous in real life. And she doesn't know what she's doing. And she has no idea if she did well or not. But they tell her she should probably read up on Charles II's sister, Henrietta. And then it's August and there are no jobs. And they haven't heard about the movie. And the borders are all out of the house for various reasons. And so everyone's depressed and cranky as hell. But then Pauline gets the idea to use the rest of her savings for the sisters to go camping. They'll be in a field next to where the doctors are staying in a cabin. And Garney agrees to stay with them. And it sounds wonderful and relaxing and fun for everybody. And then when they get back, they learn Pauline got the part in the movie. Of course she did. And she finds out it's hella boring compared to theater. And I've always thought so too. <laughs> I've never understood, aside from money. Why yeah. somebody would want to do money, film acting. Money and fame. Because yeah. you get more people that actually see it. Right. See you in. Yeah. The fame parts never sounded uh, enticing a, to me. As a kid, I was more enticed with fame. But yeah. as I got older, I was like, no, I'd much rather be the person behind the famous person than the uh, actual famous person. Yeah. See, I think like theater famous is just the right amount. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Because, like, you know, theater people all, like, love you and know who you are. But you could, like, walk down the street. Right. And most people wouldn't know. And I think... Gotcha. That sounds good. Yeah. And, I mean, but I can't say, you know, because I've never done film acting. But it just doesn't seem as rewarding as theater to me. I mean, not having the audience for one thing. Yeah, I mean, you um, it's a totally different process because you, in theater, you, you go to all the rehearsals mm -hmm. and then you have physicals complete from 
start to finish right. shows. None of the breaking up and just working on a scene a day. Well, I mean, you do in rehearsal, but and yeah, and when you're when you're doing a movie, you're literally like scheduled for a certain amount of days right. and, and, and jumping you know, around. And you have no and... idea what the all the movie's going to be like. You just go in and do your one little part, and there is no there is no finish or helping each yeah, other to it be seems, better. Yeah, incomplete and not yeah. so much a team. I right. guess. Unless it's a, a movie with a lot of primaries who have to spend a lot of time, then those right. primary, you know, a like, very Lord, small cast like, like Lord or... of the Rings had a very, uh, a, a, a small cast that spent uh-huh. a lot of time together and became very close. Yeah. Um, but... And then I think that's why TV actually sounds better to me than mm. movies because mm. like, because you're showing TV up to work cast. every day and you're yeah. doing table reads and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. Gotcha. It's like y'all working together all the time aside right. from like guest ones and yeah. But then movie is higher art considered to be, except not now so much, I don't think. Mm. I think, you know, like with Netflix and I, stuff. Yeah. Well, yeah. They're considered better, but probably not as much as film. Right. Anyway, that's just my opinion. Yeah, I don't like the, but I guess it's the same in theater where you have a time format. You know, I, I much prefer a series versus a mm. one-off film because then you're trying to fit everything you want to get across right. in a in a very small um, time frame. And I, I, that's why I'm always, always disappointed when they adapt a book into yeah. a movie you just cannot get it and they yeah and they change the story so much to try to fit it in and you know people who didn't do something right. do something because it's expedient for them to be in this or scene completely and, cut out characters yeah, yeah. i will always be salty about winky being cut out of goblet oh, of fire yeah, yeah. that's like my big one <laughs> because it is important to the whole arc of the story yeah. but anyways Anyway, um, but yeah, especially since Netflix is a thing and we can see how books can be adapted over a long format, right. how it can be done. It's like, I hope, because they will remake the Harry Potter series eventually, and I hope they do it on whatever format yeah. is like Netflix now. Yeah, do it, uh, a se- you know, book a season yeah. or yeah. Know, something like that. Yeah. That's how a lot of, Ugh, when, uh, when they so do happy. actually do... A book to a series, that's how often how it's done. Yeah, it's just so much better. Yeah. But yeah, you can't properly adapt a book for theater either because, I mean, the runtime should be about the same as a movie right. with intermissions right. put into. Yeah. Because people can't sit longer than about three hours or something. Right. <laughs> yeah. But theater's still best in my mind. It's just more complete and an overall better experience. But like I said, I haven't done anything on the other end, so I don't know. Yeah. But still. <laughs> but anyway, um, so she's really, really bored the whole time uh, until the actor who plays her brother is like actually in tears because acting, not because Pauline is so terrifying. Yeah, I was talking about they <laughs> how long they worked on this scene together and. Um, and you know, I guess how many times they actually went over it, it got mm-hmm. kind of boring and stale. And then in the actual moment, the guy was like, had real tears and was, <laughs> you know, she, she looked at him and was very surprised. Yeah. And, and had like an honest reaction right. to it. Yeah. And, and the director like praises her and it's like, that's the first time you've done anything <laughs> good, basically. And and she tells she's honest, you know, it wasn't me, it was him. He was yeah. he, I was reacting to what he did. Yeah. And he's like, you know, he can act in films and mm-hmm. you can learn something from him. And, and she's and, like, Oh, that whole thing yeah. again. Yeah. Yeah. So again, she like kind of doubles down and says, okay, I'll yeah. take things a little more seriously and it try not to be so bored and actually yeah. learn from these people. Well, she just, you know, she had to learn that different perspective, you know, at least she wasn't yeah. being bratty about it this time, but right. yeah, she just had to learn. And yeah. So from then on, she loves it and she's perfect. Of course. Hmm. 
Uh, once they wrap the movie, Pauline and Petrova both get Christmas pantomime roles. Pauline's the fairy in a Cinderella. And poor Petrova, she gets this stupid jumping bean dancer part in Jack and the Beanstalk. And it sounds terrible. <laughs> Uh, neither of them run very long, though, because King George dies and everybody's too sad to go to the theater, basically. But it's aight. But then Posey is a wreck because Madame gets thick and goes back to Russia for a long time. And I, I think the King George dying was what was like, uh, was what was oh. like, okay, what time period was that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hmm. Um... Anyway, Posey is not upset that Madame is sick, but because it's interrupting her training. So, Posey has to join a regular class, and she basically just fucks around the whole time, doing impressions of teachers and cracking everybody up. Um, but Theo, who is now in charge of the school, has had it with her, so she asks Pauline to talk to her. And Pauline knows the only way to get to her is through bribery. So she offers to buy tickets for Posey to go see this Czechoslovakian ballet dancer and his company that are coming to London. And Posey dances around naked and it's pretty weird. Um, but then she's perfect at school, so it's worth it. <laughs> uh, but oh no, the ballet is the same night as Pauline's movie premiere. But Garney goes with Posey and Nana with Pauline and Petrova. And after the screening, like, everyone's just in love with Pauline, of course, asking for her autograph and everything. And Posey that night is like, I have to work with him, the Czechoslovakian dancer. And the next morning, she just fucking disappears. She's 11, by the way. Everyone's worried, but they're like, well, she's 11. She won't get run over, probably. <laughs> um, but then Pauline's agent shows up, and this film studio wants Pauline to sign a contract for five years and move to Hollywood. And Pauline isn't sure about that all. Um, but then Posey busts in, saying she's going to Czechoslovakia to train with this guy. Uh, this little twat just walked into his rehearsal in all her ballet gear and says he should watch her dance or he'll be <laughs> sorry for not doing so. Not as like a threat, but <laughs> well, maybe. <laughs> anyway, uh, so he obviously does. And he's like desperate to work with this 11 year old child. Like, what? I don't care how good she is. Anyways. Anyways, that will cost money to send her there, obviously. So Pauline marches in and signs that contract so they can send Posey. And then the girls are like, well, being a dancer and an actress aren't going to get us into serious history books. So it's all up to you, Petrova, to like be a pilot or an adventurer or something really dope like that. And then this old motherfucker comes in the front door. It's Gum. Finally back from who knows where. And he's like shocked they're not babies still. Yeah. So they fill him in on their lives in like what seems like five minutes. And it, on Pauline and Posey's future plans. But um, Gum swung around and looked at Petrova. What se that seems to leave you and me. What would you like to do? What do you like to do? Flying in motor cars, Posey put in before Petrova could answer. That suits me, Gum looked pleased. I like to fly and get about quickly. There are lots of things you can pick up if you get about quickly. Cook and Clara still here? They told him they were. Good, then they shall look after us as you're taking Sylvia and Nana. Might hire a car tomorrow, Petrova, and find a house near an aerodrome where you could study. So... It all ends happily ever after. But the sisters don't seem worried or upset at all about being split up. And I think that's hella weird. <laughs> at least for Petrova and Pauline. Not yeah. Posey, because she's terrible. But, yeah. 
but they were really close, and it's like, nope, let's all move thousands of well, miles away. I think away. it's one of those things where um, you can be excited about what's coming up, and then you then you start thinking about it, and you're sad yeah. as it gets closer. Yeah, maybe, because they are still very young. Yeah. Pauline's like 15 and a half, I think it said at this point, so. Yeah, okay, I'll go with that. And so did you have a favorite bit? Um, I guess I should think about this beforehand. Uh, yeah, you know it's coming. A favorite bit. I'll tell you mine. Okay. What do you think? Um... Well, overall, the doctors were great, um, but particularly when they're seeing Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, that was good. That was good. <laughs> In the dress circle, Dr. Smith and Dr. Jakes enjoyed themselves, as true Shakespeareans also always enjoy themselves, arguing between each act about the reading of the parts and the way the lines were said. Fortunately, they found plenty to disapprove of, or they would not have enjoyed themselves at all. Yeah, okay. That is real, real. <laughs> like, even when I love a show... It doesn't feel quite complete unless there's something to critique, <laughs> which sounds terrible, but I think all theater people do it. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyways, I love that bit in them overall. So, You too? Yeah, it's good. Okay. Least favorite? Uh, how, uh, how bitchy Pauline was. Oh, As... when she was Alice? Yeah. Yeah, that was pretty terrible. Well, along that line, Posey. Posey overall for me. <laughs> it's like, I mean, I'm glad we didn't spend as much time on her as Pauline and Petrova, but maybe it would have made me a little bit more, you know, inclined to her mm -hmm. if we had. But yeah, no, I don't care how good you are or how old you are. Um, you don't get to be a narcissistic little twat. You just don't. Um, like, at least Pauline and Petrova tried to bring her down a little mm -hmm. by, like, picking on her and stuff. But uh, the grown-ups could have done a much better job. They just let her go about just yeah. fucking around the whole time. And they had Pauline, you know, learn her lesson. But Posey never does, and I hate it. But you liked it overall? Yeah. It's, it's a good classic yeah, I love it very much. Hey, kids! Do you love fighting over the card catalog? Totally! Now you can find your favorite podcast all over the World Wide Web. Look for us on Facebook, Instagram, Tumblr, YouTube, and Pinterest at Fighting Over the Card Catalog or on Twitter at Card Catalog Pod. And as a special bonus, head over to our very own website fightingoverthecardcatalog.com And now, you can get the inside scoop on co-host Jess on Instagram and Twitter at Jess Digress. Whoa! Next, you can become a junior cataloger just by sharing us with your friends and rating and subscribing on Apple Podcasts. Whoa! Available wherever podcasts are sold podcast not actually sold but available in all podcatchers for free junior catalogers under the age of 18 ask your parent or guardian's permission before downloading so yeah let's go to the no snark zone <laughs> welcome to the no snark zone or how's the pandemic going for you <laughs> <laughs> So I've got a few things to bitch about. You want me to go ahead and go first, or you want to get your bitching out? Um. Well, bitching wise, basically eat the rich. Everybody just eat the rich. I mean, I'm not even going to talk about what's going on in Congress and stuff here in the U.S. Um, because it'll be way old news by the time we just release this episode on yeah. Friday morning. Um, but that's all really pissing me off. I see you, Canada, doing good work with your stuff. Uh, even England, y'all had a rough time there, but you're coming out with good help stuff. Um, we still can't decide. So anyways, that's my big bitching part. Yeah. And then so, our county. <laughs> so we've got some people trying to, in the Congress, trying to help, um, with debt relief from, um, um, 
student loan debt. Mm-hmm. Um, people are going against that. Um, then there, there's also this thing where they're trying to get $500 billion in discretionary money that the White House can give to whoever. The flush it funds that, for I say White House. It's FEMA. It's a federal program. He controls who's in charge of FEMA. Therefore, he controls how that money gets spent. And there, is, there was in the original Senate bill, there were no, oh, there was no oversight at all. Yeah. And <laughs> President Trump said, "Don't worry, I'll oversee yeah. it all." And I'll everybody's make like, sure. "That's the problem, <laughs> you dumb shit." <laughs> he said, "I'll be the oversight." Like, yeah, that's real. It's uh, still so much there. confidence. Yeah. yeah. Um, so then they were trying to get, you know, the Democrats are trying to get stuff in the bill where people from the White House, people in Congress, um, and f- their families cannot, um, benefit from these bills. And that was, that was a, that yeah. was part of it, a big part of it. Right now it's unemployment. Um, so, uh, the next bitching thing that I have oh, is okay. that the G8 was trying to make a statement oh. on- on the coronavirus, and the United States insists on calling it the Wuhan virus. To be racist. <laughs> and uh, so it never, it never passed. And the GA could not release a statement because they couldn't, they couldn't agree on the wording because of the United States. It's G7 now, though. G7, excuse me. Yeah. Um, the third thing is... That we have a uh, shelter in place, except okay, for... Okay, this motherfucking county we live in, I swear to fucking God. Except for essential businesses. And during the press conference yesterday, a reporter said, well, let me get this straight. You're saying essential businesses, but then you're saying all businesses are essential. So basically any business can stay open. And they clarified, yes, Mm -hmm. that is exactly what we mean. As long as you follow the rules of social distancing and no more than 10 people gathered at a time. It also says if that's impossible in the normal course of business, Mm -hmm. just you know, do your best. That's right. not the exact wording on that part, but it's it. That's what it says. So it's like you don't even have to do anything, technically. So here's the thing: in Texas, we don't have a statewide um, order for anything. It's going county by county, and so all the other counties in the Dallas Fort Worth metroplex have a stay at home, shelter in place whatever it is, straight out. Um, But not our county, because our county is the most conservative in the Metroplex. So they're going by what, you know, the governor and the lieutenant fucking governor are saying, and Trump is saying, was that, you know, letting the economy crash is worse than all these people dying. Yes. Let your grandparents die. (sighs) And then uh, most of the counties in the state, though, don't have anything because it's not hitting there. Yeah. Um, so, so our, and, but every other big city in Texas has the shelter yeah. in place right now. So our lieutenant governor, Dan Patrick, basically said that... On TV. Most of y'all saw this, I'm sure. Americans, at least. That the old people should be willing to give up their lives to keep the economy in America moving. Stable for their grandchildren. Yeah. So they want people to actually go and expose themselves and keep. Yeah. Did you hear Kentucky is calling for coronavirus parties? So people will get it and become immune. They think. To it. Like people (sighs) used to have chicken pox parties and stuff. Yeah. It's not the same. Anyways. So day to day, my day to day life hasn't really changed much, to be honest. Yeah. <laughs> Since, you know, I mean, you know, in the recent past, it's just been exhausting for me to go out and stuff. So, yeah, I'd go out like once in, on the weekends or sometimes not every weekend. So it's really no different for me. Just like uh, extra worrying about, you know, my health and catching it because it could be very bad. If I do. Yeah. Um, and then, I mean, like for you, we'd already gotten used to you working at home and just basically gotten 
I mean, it's really only been a few weeks where he'd had to go to work, into work every day. Yeah, so they were redoing our area, and and you know, so I was working from home a little bit, little yeah. bits. Um, they wanted me to work at the office because um, I help all train all the new guys. Because you're just too and, good, <laughs> and you know, answering <laughs> questions and and helping with the tools, et cetera. Yeah. Um, but with this, I'm like, you know, I there's st- still apparently a lot of people going into the yeah. office. And I'm like, now nah, I've got a immunocompromised mm-hmm. wife at home. I'm not going to keep working here. But it's basically, I'm still working as many hours. I'm still yeah, working. Yeah, it's really not fifty hours a week, but I'm just doing it because from you know here. I hear everybody saying, you know, oh, we've got all this extra time now, and so I start thinking that, <laughs> like, oh, we could do this. And it's like, no, this isn't no. any different. We don't have more time yeah. than we've had. So I mean, we just don't go out for a couple hours on a Friday afternoon or a Saturday or something. That's, right. that's like that's it. That's basically it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't just, well, it's like I was, I, w- I wanted to get new light bulbs and I'm like, I'm not going to Walmart to get new light bulbs. Yeah, no. So my change is instead of getting in the car and going to get light bulbs, I got online and looked for light bulbs. Yeah. Even though and it's going to take a while. twice as much. Yeah. yeah. But yeah, I mean, you did go grocery shopping last Yeah, so I'm going weekend. grocery shopping basically With gloves. <laughs> um, once a week. I'm going to go on Fridays. I get off early on Fridays. and <laughs> From <and>, home. <laughs> <laughs> well, still. I mean, where I don't, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm not obligated to work yes. after that time. <laughs> and so I can go in before everybody else gets off work or what, whatever people are doing mm-hmm. now. And yeah. wear gloves and... <laughs> Um, get you know my week's worth of grocery shopping done in that one time, and then that's basically all I go out with whatever they have. Um, <laughs> yeah, basically, you know, we did a stew and that lasted us a few days, and then we did a roast that's lasted us a couple of days, yeah. so yeah, yeah, we're definitely eating different, we're eating more leftovers and stuff. We are, but this motherfucker across the street, this motherfucker. <laughs> Guys, we don't like these people anyway. We don't. They're pretty terrible. I wouldn't say we hate them, but we do not like them. Yeah. They, you know. We've never talked to them. Often have like <laughs> four or five cars. Yeah, and they like have to park to... in front of other people's houses all the time. Yeah. And... and we need to turn around so we can go in backwards because our driveway is yeah. on a slope. And I can't get out of the car with the door coming in on me. <laughs> Uh, oftentimes so, on garbage their cars days, are in the way for us to do oftentimes that. Oftentimes on garbage days, they have cars blocking where <sighs> you put your t- trash cans. So they'll wheel their trash cans in front of our house mm-hmm. and leave what them there. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> this is like stupid, like but, a hashtag first world <laughs> suburban yeah, problems, yeah. by the way. Uh, I am aware of this. <laughs> so this guy, I see this morning because my office is right by the front uh, window. So I open the window mm-hmm. and I, uh, you, you know, listen to the birds and. <laughs> There's so many bees <laughs> outside. See the dogs walking by and yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this guy comes out with his golf clubs this morning <laughs> and he and his buddy went golfing. Because that's essential business in Collin County, I guess. Yep. That's essential golfing. (sighs) Mainly, I don't like this guy for him yelling at his kids so much. Mm. You know, that really started it. But anyway. Man. And they've had, (laughs) in the time that we've had two cars, they've had. So many. Probably nine. (sighs) Probably. Uh, Trying to think. There's something shady going on with them. At least eight, but I think nine. Cars. <laughs> I you're able to recall yeah. all that. I just know bunch of the difference. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, uh, I have some good things from all well, this last week, I guess. Mm-hmm. It's been hella warm and nice this week. Uh-huh. And I've been able to sit out back and work on stuff, and that's nice. And then today, I heard kids a few houses over behind us um, having the best time with their dad out on a trampoline in the middle of a random Wednesday afternoon. And so I'm like, you know, that's yeah. nice. Yeah, that's one you know, thing I've seen. Is I know a- it's a lot of stress um, for parents right now, yeah. but... 
So I've seen during the day um, parents walking with their kids mm-hmm. down the sidewalk and they're, the kids are on a bike and they're walking their dog or something. Yeah, in the middle so of a random yeah. weekday. So that, that's been nice to see. Yeah. So I'm trying to concentrate I, on that Another sort of nice stuff. thing it's just nice. is that some um, uh, humane societies and animal shelters have, yeah. have emptied of dogs and cats because apparently people have time now to... Yeah. Train, and train they want them to get used to their house and yeah. have some companionship. And yeah, that's, and they want that's some been comfort. really good. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I hope there's not a big rush to take them all back at, when it's over. Probably not, I think, because it's going to last a long time. Mm. Oh, no. It's just till Easter. Shut up. <laughs> then we will all rise again. The economy shall rise again. You know, I, after he said that, it had like it went up huge, hugely. After he said that the other day, man, it it is so amazing to me that these politicians can literally say the economy is more important than your life, and people still will vote it's for them. It's unbelievable. People will unbelievable. still the next time say, "Oh yeah." yeah. Oh, my God. All right. Let's leave that. Yeah. <laughs> we were on a good note. <laughs> Anyways, what are you reading? Um, I'm reading nothing. You oh. want to know what I've read? Yes. Um, so I finished the... The... Um, Star Wars book. I finished the Star Wars book, mm-hmm. Fatal Alliance. It was the first in the series, but I read right. it fourth. <laughs> that was all right. Did uh, it matter? Did it end up mattering too much that you no, read it out of order? No, they were really, they were pretty much separate books. Okay. Um, I read uh, Truth Witch by Susan uh, Denard. Um, that was good. Um, I'll... I'm on the wait list for the second book for that. Um, I started reading a book uh, called The Conjuring of Assassins by Kate Glass. Mm-hmm. And about halfway through, literally well, six hours of 13 hour book, I decided I just didn't care enough. And that hurts. <laughs> I stopped. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, that's. Yeah. See, that's how I felt with my last two books I tried reading and why I haven't been reading much at all. Mm. But I got... I'm afraid that's what happened to my mom because she said she hasn't been reading much lately. Yeah. And I'm afraid she's got... She got through the good books and then... All the good books in the world. <laughs> the good books that she knew of. And then yeah. she bought some that she just didn't care about. And it's true when you read... Because she reads um, sci-fi fantasy. Mm-hmm. Because that's what Monko read. And anyway, right. it is very true with sci-fi fantasy where you will get a book that you've literally had the exact same story from another sci-fi oh. fantasy. And it just is boring to read it a second time. Yeah. You know, from with just different characters yeah. and slightly different settings. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, I, I can see that. Uh. She needs to expand, do some historical mm-hmm. fiction in between, yeah. something like that. Yeah. See, I kind of feel that way about historical fiction stuff, but I think I read too much World War II Mm. in particular, and so, yeah, that does kind of all end up. But I got a new charger for my extremely old iPad. It's a Generation 1. I mean, it's old. Um, Like... So the operating system doesn't update anymore, and so that means a lot of apps just don't work on it anymore. Right. But... I enjoy reading on it, and it's easy to download books on it, except you can't actually download on the iPad. It won't download things, so I have to download on my computer and then hook it up like this old-timey stuff. But anyways, so I'm hoping that might get me back into reading. Mm. So so we'll see. Anyway. My mom has a nook that she never learned how to actually use. If you're interested Maybe. in getting that. Oh, and also another thing is, since I'll have that, I'll try to leave my phone in the living room at night and not put Twitter or anything on the iPad, if it even worked. Mm. So I'm not looking at that and reading instead. <laughs> yeah, that's my intention anyway. Gotcha. Yeah. So or, anyway. Or TikTok. 
or TikTok. Y'all, I'm enjoying watching the kids so much. Oh my God. I'm never making any TikTok videos myself, but man, they're funny. And it's so good now with the pandemic because it's like college kids are back home like when they shouldn't be and they're all bored and watching all these family dynamics, but then they're getting the whole family to do the dances and stuff. And it's just really amusing. And I like seeing these kids like do so much creatively. Like it's really not that stupid. Like they do have to put in time and effort and use a lot of creativity and right. or do the dances and learn how to do that. And like, I enjoy watching it. It's very funny. And there's so many dogs. Oh my God. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> yeah i'll hear like every day there's at least one that says apparently tiktok loves this so it, oh. it, and it just like shows you a puppy <laughs> something like <Yeah>. that <laughs> anyway next week we're gonna read back on our babysitters club mm. bullshit uh little miss stony brook dot 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 and dawn all right Thanks for listening. We're reading the books of your childhood. So you don't have to. Bye, everybody. Goodbye.